We are pleased to have Dr. Andrew Ringer join us to talk about the role of artificial intelligence in neurosurgery. He is chairman of Mayfield Brain and Spine and chief of neurosciences at TriHealth. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ringer. You may now begin your presentation. Thanks, Krista, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us on the webinar this evening. I appreciate you taking time out of your evening. Uh, I know that uh, we often talk about our you know, favorite personal topic when we uh, get together for these uh, webinars, for these talks <clears throat> about, about aneurysms, but really aneurysms and the devastating effects that they have are part of a larger category of disease that we refer to in the medical vernacular as stroke. So when you usually hear on the, on the, on the street somebody who had a stroke, typically that, what that means is a brain feeding artery was blocked usually by a blood clot or cholesterol plaque, <clears throat> and that starved the brain of blood flow. But as far as, far as physicians and research or medical researchers are concerned, uh, bleeding into the brain or bleeding around the brain from an aneurysm is also a form of stroke. It's just a little bit different mechanism. So that's one of the things that we as neurosurgeons uh, treat uh, a lot, which is uh, strokes of all different shapes and sizes. And one of the key things, as you can imagine, is very, very important in uh, treating stroke is, whether it's a bleeding stroke or an ischemic stroke from loss of blood flow, is time. Getting the right information, getting it synthesized quickly and communicating it between people. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence helps us to do this, but first we're gonna to have to understand exactly what is artificial intelligence. So you see here, this is a, a uh, definition that I took from, from a uh, online um, dictionary about artificial intelligence, which it refers to the use of machines or computers that may be able to learn processes or patterns in such a way as to apply them to make decisions much the way the human mind does when we synthesize information and make decisions based on it as well. Uh, the term itself was coined back in the 50s at a uh, computing conference uh, uh, that was held at Dartmouth College, but intended by computer specialists from IBM, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and that's where they really start, first started using the term artificial intelligence. But the first work that was uh, kind of led to this artificial intelligence was really done by a British scientist known as Alan Turing. Uh, if anybody's ever seen um, uh, the, the, the couple of movies that have been out over the past several years about the Nazi Enigma machine, this all is based on the the work of Alan Turing, who in the 40s uh, worked at Bletchley Park in England with a number of other scientists to figure out how to crack the Nazi code that was that changed every 24 hours. The Nazis had this machine that would change the code every 24 hours. And it was a very complex code <clears throat> with millions of different possible uh, interpretations. And by the time these uh, scientists had worked through manually figuring out how uh, the code was, uh, uh, and acted for that particular day, the day was over and they went on to another code and they had to start all over. So they never really got any useful information. So Turing thought, well, perhaps I can just have a machine that runs through all of the different possibilities and, and eliminates them in a sequential order and understands the patterns of, of how the letters and numbers are changed in this code. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later. Uh, the first work that was called true Arti artificial intelligence, however, was done in uh, the 1943, 1943, again, based on some of the work from Turing, uh, where they used what we called artificial neurons. So this is Alan Turing, who came up with the, the process of artificial intelligence, even though he didn't call it that. And what you see behind him is the Turing machine. That is the first version of a computer, and that thing uh, in case you don't understand the scale there, you can see the, the pedestrian tape in front of it uh, at the museum where it's being displayed. So you can understand that's usually about the, the level of your waist. So this thing is like a huge gargantuan piece of furniture uh, that would barely fit in your dining room. So it, it is, it's just massive. And it, it tells you a lot about what we've done in the meantime to change our computers. But the basic idea was to crack the code that came from this machine. So this is a typing machine. This was the Nazi Enigma machine. And all they would have to do is if you can see these little plugs and wires down here, they would switch the sequence of these wires and it would change uh, how the letters came out when the typist was typing out the message. So the typist could type out 
good morning, it's Monday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, but the letters would come out all jumbled based on how you switch these wires around. So it was very, very random. Uh, and, and that's why uh, 26 letters and uh, 26 times a different type of uh, characters that could come out from each one of them. There were millions of different possibilities. And it was so difficult to interpret. But Turing's idea was that if there is uh, a, a sort of a binary answer for each potential uh, explanation here, each potential um, uh, sequence, that let the computer decide which way it's going on, on, on each, uh, each sequence. And then based on what the next answer is, that tells you how to interpret the first answer. And then when the third answer comes up, that tells you how to answer how to interpret the second and the first answer. And then it just keeps going. Uh, this is kind of where the zeros and ones that you hear about for computer language, it all came from Alan Turing, who decided that this is how you can interpret these patterns. Now, why does that matter you know, when it comes to taking care of stroke? Well, stroke care is pretty complicated. There is over here on the left, this is a typical algorithm for treatment decisions on how to decide what scans each patient needs, what kind of treatment do they need, who needs to be admitted to the hospital and who doesn't, who needs to go to the ICU when they're in the hospital, who needs an extra scan to look at the arteries, who needs a scan to look at the uh, quality of the blood flow to their brain, who needs an MRI, who needs a CT scan, and who needs emergency surgery, and who just needs medication, who needs both, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are all these different uh, uh, changes, and the, and the definitions and the decisions are changing all the time as new research comes in. Meanwhile, you see over on the right, this is the graph, again, we call time equals brain, that tells you what is the likelihood of making a good functional recovery after a stroke based on the number of minutes after the stroke has started. So you can see here, we're getting, as we have to get out past two and a half to three hours, and on into four hours, the likelihood of surviving and making a good recovery drops and goes below 50% once you get out to about five hours. So running through, getting a patient to the hospital, deciding what scans they need, getting the scans done, making the next decision and moving on to the next thing and getting it all done and opening the artery within this time frame, very, very difficult. It requires a lot of coordinated teamwork. So how, um, um, the, the, other, the other side of the argument not only could we use some help in the decision making, uh, but but the hospitals understand that they they will save a lot of money uh, if they treat people well and get these strokes treated and get people out of the hospital and onto recovery than if they have very, very sick patients on their hands who are not recovering. So as if getting people better weren't enough, there's there it, there's actually a financial advantage to to having a good outcome as well. So this is where one of the two different uh, types of uh, artificial intelligence that, we're, that are currently um, under evaluation and, and to some degree of use in, in stroke care come into play. So this is actually an application that Mayfield Clinic helped uh, get for both TriHealth and St. Elizabeth uh, and for Mercy. So for those three hospital systems around the town, we, we were able to help uh, those hospital systems negotiate with this company and, and bring this kind of artificial intelligence to use across the community. It's called Viz AI, so visualization of artificial intelligence is kind of how you think of it. And it is, just like you see on that screen, it's an app that shows up on my phone, which is way, way, way smaller than carrying around a Turing machine with you, as you can imagine. So what happens is, the patient comes in, they, uh, somebody orders a CT scan or a series of CT scans because they're concerned about a stroke. There is a splitter basically that sits next to the scanner so that when they send the images that they've scanned on the patient to their uh, radiology review center, it simultaneously sends those images up to the cloud. This cloud has an artificial algorithm, an artificial intelligence algorithm in place. It helps look at the images and see if it can recognize a pattern that is suspicious for a stroke. And if it does, it alerts me on my phone with a big annoying noise. It sounds like an amber alert or something. You just simply can't miss it and you can't sleep through it. So there are a couple of different ways that helps. This first one, the Viz LVO, that looked, refers to a large vessel occlusion. That helps us decide, is there a large artery inside the head that look, appears to be blocked when we inject dye to see the arteries uh, because the dye doesn't get through the arteries? So if you look at this picture, you'll notice a lot of white over here on our screen's left, which is the patient's right. 
And we see that that line and that squiggly stuff over here on the other side is simply absent. So the artery is blocked here. The, the computer can recognize that there's asymmetry and loss of signal on the other side. And so it sends off an alert uh, onto my phone. I immediately open the app, take a look at it and say, yep, sure enough, that's blocked. If we're concerned that that patient might not be a candidate then one of the, for, for treatment for their stroke to try to open the artery as an emergency, because we just, just don't know is the brain still salvageable or is it too late? Did the stroke already happen? Then we go to the next step, which is CTP. That stands for CT or CAT scan perfusion, which refers to the quality of the blood flow. And that shows we color-coded maps of the brain. They show an area of brain here in red that's already looks like the tissue is permanently damaged. But this area in yellow or green that uh, where the area is starving for blood flow, but it hasn't it hasn't gone under per permanent damage yet. So in this example, you see here, there's a large territory brain that, if left untreated, is likely to go on to have a, a stroke, uh, but might still be reversible now. So that helps us to make those kinds of decisions. And all that again is available to me on my on my phone. Not only is that the case. But the other physicians who are involved in taking care of that patient, the medical stroke specialists, the emergency room doctors, the doctors in our neurocritical care units, particularly here at TriHealth, for example, they have this app as well. So if I see those images and I'm concerned, I can then use the app to, to, to send a message to those doctors saying, here's what I think is going on. Here's what I think needs to happen. Do you have any other information about this patient that would be helpful? And then they send it back to me and all of it is uh, legal and compliant with privacy laws for medical because of the type of a encoded encryption that they use to send those messages. So as soon as I've seen the pictures, I start sending my message. I type it in like I do a text message. The doc other doctors see it right away. They message back to me. And within a couple of minutes, we've made a decision as to what needs to happen for this patient. So again, uh, uh, what, what happens is they, they started by sending up a lot of different uh, CAT scans and CT scans with this dye to look at the arteries into the a computer. They initially told the computer which ones had large vessels that were blocked off and which ones didn't until it started to learn the pattern. Then the, the computer starts to guess and sends you its best guess and you tell it to, if it's right or not. And it, and it just keeps uh, doing that over many, many repetitions. The computer learns the correct patterns and it gets more and more precise and more accurate. Uh, so again, what, the way that works, that, that information, because it's coming straight from the scanner, we're not waiting for it to show up in radiology. We're not waiting for another person to interpret those images and tell us what it says. It's coming out to me and all of my coworkers on the stroke team simultaneously. So we all have it right away and we can immediately start discussing it. Uh, this, is the, this is the perfusion software, which again, works a little bit differently. Instead of simply looking at what areas of brain get dye and which ones don't. It also looks at the timing and how quickly that dye gets up into the brain uh, so it can tell me if the blood flow is good, kind of good, or really bad. Uh, and as you see, this is sort of a comparison on this side. What happens on the bottom, this is what used to happen. The patient would go to a scanner. They would get their scan done. The technologist would process the images, send it off to a radiologist who would get a preliminary reading, He'd call the emergency room doctor. He or she then would call the stroke specialist, who if the stroke specialist then went back and looked at the images themselves, agreed with what everybody else said, and thought it was a big problem, then they would call me and ask me to come in and do an emergency procedure so we could go on and do the treatment. But the way workflow works now is those images are done, and as soon as the technologist has acquired the images, they go up to the cloud, they're processed by that, that uh, robot, as we call it, and all of us are notified at the same time. The radiologist, the ER doctor, the stroke specialist, myself, we're all notified at the same time, and we start chatting and deciding what needs to happen. So you can just imagine the kind of time that that saves. And this is a little bit about how it works. They, you, you put your uh, router in here uh, next to the scanner, and it gets through a firewall to, into a secure uh, a server up on the cloud which runs the algorithms and sends the images back down to the, to the radiology uh, image, um, image system, but then sends the images out to the rest of us as well. So we're really, really excited about this. We, we use this kind of thing a lot. Uh, you know, instead of uh, watching uh, as a patient comes through, I'm waiting for the scan to be done. I'm waiting for somebody else to process the images. Then I'm waiting for the radiologist to read them. Then I'm waiting for the ER doctor to hear it. And then I don't even hear about it until it's been a couple of hours 
that the patient's been uh, getting worked up. Uh, instead, uh, what can happen is uh, you see all that stuff happening simultaneously because everybody's notified at the same time. And with a matter of uh, five or six minutes, we all have the pictures on our phones and we start chatting and making the decision. And we can save more than an hour, sometimes two, in the treatment decision and, and the uh, treatment plan for that patient. So it can save a lot of time, which makes it a lot more likely that we can help that patient. So this is a very important thing, uh, but there's, I mentioned another really uh, devastating form of stroke that we treat. Sometimes it's uh, proven very difficult. And this is uh, uh, what we call intracerebral hemorrhage or, or hemorrhagic stroke. And unlike uh, the hemorrhages that occur most of the time with, with aneurysms where the bleeding is in the spinal fluid space around the brain, in these cases, the stroke occurs by bleeding into the brain tissue itself. It's a little bit different than an aneurysm. And where with aneurysms and ischemic strokes or blocked arteries, we really know what the right thing to do is. We know we have to fix that aneurysm before it can bleed again in, in, in our aneurysm patients. We know that the, the artery is blocked and the brain is still survivable, that we need to open up that artery uh, to treat the stroke patient. But unfortunately, you would think we would know the same thing about bleeding into the brain. These pictures are CAT scans of different patients where the white represents the blood in the brain causing pressure on the brain in a devastating effect. Uh, it, it's, it, you look at these and you think it's got to make sense that we have to go in surgically and take that blood out and relieve the pressure from the brain. But as it turns out, many times when we do that kind of surgery, the patient doesn't get any better. And we don't know exactly why that is, but there are a lot of different theories about it. And this again is, uh, is not meant uh, to give you a lot of specific data or anything, but just look at how complicated these charts look. These are the types of charts that were used to uh, decide which patients need surgery and which ones don't for certain clinical scientific trials. And as you can see, they're all different. And the reason is everybody has a different theory about which, which patients might get better with surgery and which ones might not. And so all of these trials were done, each one of them trying to look at various different variables to decide how do we know which patient is gonna get better with surgery and could benefit from it and which one won't. And then the answer was from each of these trials, nobody. The, the patients who got surgery and the patients who didn't have surgery ended up doing the same. And we think that there may, you know, there may be something right about every single one of these trials and every single one of these parameters, but it's how they mix together. And it just gets so complicated that we can't really, uh, on, on a minute to minute or hour to hour basis in the hospital, synthesize all the different information and how it interacts with each other what happens to the disrupted tissue, what happens to the pressure on the brain as it swells, does it cause a reduction in blood flow, which may reduce blood flow and cause other strokes in the tissue around it? Is there a, a toxic effect of the, uh, the chemicals that uh, form when blood clots form inside the brain? How do we measure that? How do we know what's happening? How do we inter intervene to stop these processes? It's just very, very complicated. So uh, another company that Mayfield is working with, um, a company out of Minnesota, uh, is working with us to develop some clinical trials for another type of artificial intelligence. And this is basically a, uh, a patient monitor system <clears throat> that can monitor many of those variables that we saw on the chart earlier. And it can synthesize all those information uh, simultaneously and instantaneously. So the, the hundreds of th thousands of different data points, all of these salt balance uh, issues that we have, the blood pressure, the, cha the changes in blood pressure, the rate at which the blood pressure changes, the blood clotting ability of the patient, the pressure in the brain, the size of the hemorrhage on CT scan, the amount of brain that appears swollen around the hemorrhage on the CT scan, the spinal fluid pressures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these different, these different parameters, this monitor can, can synthesize all of that information simultaneously and help identify those patients that are most prone to going on to a bad outcome and who might, who might require some sort of surgical intervention in order to avoid that. So it's, it integrates all this information in real time. It, uh, it targets specific laboratories, medication use, and procedures that are done from the electronic medical record. And it runs an artificial intelligence-driven segmentation of the scanning to, to, again, like the other product, 
identify what parts of the brain look normal, which ones don't look normal, which ones look like blood, and how has that been changing since the last CT scan. And it puts all this information into an algorithm that it tries to identify patients who are at risk. Now, this is not something that's currently in clinical practice yet. That's because we are in the process of teaching this, again, I'm gonna use the phrase robot, it's not really a robot, but this machine, we're in the process of teaching this computed, uh, the computer algorithm, uh, how to find patients who do well and who do poorly. And so Mayfield has started by, along with a number of other institutions, providing information, historical information on patients that we've managed over the years, who have had intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, this type of bleeding stroke. We give them the CT scans, we tell them how the patients did, which ones did well, which ones did not do well. Uh, we'll, pro we'll provide some additional clinical information for them. Then it goes on to the next step where you start testing that theory, you start monitoring and collecting this data, and you uh, just watch to see how what happens to patients and it develops the algorithm. And we're hopeful that over the course of uh, several uh, uh, several years of testing and trial, that we can maybe teach this machine how to work and uh, create a really, really valuable tool. So it's uh, this is just kind of a little bit how it works. We send a bunch of uh, CT scans that, uh, that are done um, during and after the diagnosis. Uh, we, we, the radiologists read the images to tell the computer what's, what looks like blood, what looks like swollen brain, what looks like normal brain. Then we provide all the demographic patient information uh, as well as specifics about the hemorrhage itself, the volume, how much blood into the spinal fluid space, et cetera, et cetera, all these different variables. We're going to send that into them, into the company, as well as anything that we had to do for, <coughs> excuse me, for that patient. Uh, including things done to measure the spinal fluid pressure or the brain pressures and to drain that spinal fluid if necessary, any surgical uh, intervention that was necessary for that patient. And it helps to teach that, um, uh, and this is the outcomes data, how, how the patient did in the long run after after 90 days after their, uh, after their stroke. Uh, and that helps the, the computer learn what are the signals that indicate this patient's gonna do well or this patient's not gonna do so well. And what can we do to intervene with that? So these, these are a couple of examples <laughs> about how uh, computers, their ability to synthesize very large amounts of, uh, of data, to recognize patterns and to do it really instantaneously and then provide a rapid means of communication for that information to the clinicians. Uh, this, these are two examples of how that can really, really work well and potentially have a very significant impact on how we manage our, our patients with stroke. So I don't want anybody to think of artificial intelligence as some sort of robot doctor that's gonna start taking over from your personal doctor. No, this is not Andy Ringer in the year 2070 or 2120. This is, uh, I want you to think instead about artificial intelligence as a tool that your doctor will use to make meaningful and careful and helpful decisions in your care and for the care of your loved ones. This is really just another thing that we use to decide what we can do best for our patients. Uh, so we're very excited about this. We're, we're uh, really thrilled with how this technology has turned out. We are excited to be a part of helping to make it better. Uh, this is just part of what Mayfield has always done, uh, both with aneurysms, with brain tumors, with stroke, with <laughs> spine care. Uh, being involved in you know what is getting what's bet, what's going to make things better and what's uh, what's new uh, for each of our patients. So I think that pretty well uh, covers that that topic in general. I know that was a whole lot of information. Uh, so if anybody has some questions, uh, I think that you can probably submit them on the um, on the webinar uh, webinar and uh, they'll come through and then Chris and I can kind of go through them and we'll try to answer them for you. Uh, but again, this is a, a very exciting uh, phase of, of science. Um, this is a brand new kind of science that we're bringing to, neuro, to neuroscience care, and we're very excited about it. Thank you, Dr. Ringer. That was very, very interesting. And we already have a few questions, so I'm just going to get right to it. The first one is, um, what opportunities exist for survivors to participate in research as subjects or if we have career experience that may lend itself to writing, literature, reviews, data collection, could we be of assistance? And if so, who should we contact? 
Yeah, so the the, um, the first and most obvious way that our patients help us with uh, developments like these is to, to participate in clinical trials and teaching events. Uh, so when we are, uh, you know, when, when we have personalized data that has to be used for um, uh, gauging patients' outcomes, for example, uh, we sometimes need your permission to do that. So if we, if you are willing to let us try to uh, use your your medical information for a clinical study, then we would ask and, and seek your permission to do so. And if you grant it, that's a, a really obviously a great big help to us. Um, I think being part of educational events like these, uh, keeping yourself informed so that you know what's out there and what's what's developing, that's also helpful because it helps get the word out. You know, it helps the community understand what uh, what is changing in healthcare and what's happening in our community to help make that make that change. Uh, you know, the the uh, probably the next piece is uh, is in ad in advocacy I would say that uh, one of the things that that probably probably the biggest thing that gets in the way of uh, clinical developments like this happening is funding for research so uh, as you know uh, every year our government is more and more strapped with uh, um, funding sources there are other private funding sources but the dollars available to go to clinical and medical research, are dwindling all the time, and they're in greater and greater demand all the time. <clears throat> so, um, helping your, uh, uh, you, know, you know, whether it's donating to foundations that help work like the Mayfield Education Research Foundation or MRF, as we call it, whether it's donating to American Heart Association, which which helps to fund stroke and aneurysm research as well as uh, heart disease research. Uh, if it's going to your your state or, lo or uh, local or national government, talking to your representative to ensure that National Institutes of Health is well funded, for example, all the, all these things are important, and we need your support in doing that. Very very good, thank you. Um, so the next two questions are kind of uh, related. I think one is talking a little bit about Viz AI and one about Minitronics. So one is how long have you been using this new technology? And the other is when do you estimate that this technology would be available? Yeah, so the, we have been using the Viz AI. That is, uh, that is an FDA approved product and we've been using it here for about a year and a half. Um, you know, I think we were, we were the uh, uh, first stroke uh, service here in the, in the region to use it. Um, but it, it had started a little bit in some other locations too. I think that um, the company has been so thrilled with how we've put it to use to kind of cover an entire community, you know, uh, synthesizing different and coordinating different health systems together. They've actually come back to us to ask Mayfield to help them with uh, further development of new products that they want to do and to help uh, teach people how to use it. Uh, so that's that's it's very exciting to see that they may expand the the possibilities of what they can do. The Minitronics thing is really hard to tell uh, because first of all, we don't know if it's going to work. You know, quite frankly, we 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 uh, um, uh, most of us believe that there has got to be a subset of patients who are going to require and benefit from surgical intervention. But deciding who they are and comparing and, and selecting them out from all the other patients for, for whom surgery may not be helpful, very, very difficult to do. Uh, but we, uh, and we're very optimistic that this will work, but we don't know that yet, not until we actually put it to trials and find out. And there, and trials, clinical trials and clinical development takes a lot of time because there's a very organized and stepwise prog uh, progress or process that we go through from uh, first. Uh, in this case, it'd be gathering all the information and developing the algorithm for the for the robot. Again, just the phrase I like to use. Um, then it is a test run in patients uh, or clinical situations to see does it correlate with what we're seeing, and then you put it to a clinical trial where you compare does it does it add benefit to the patients? Do do does it provide information that actually helps to improve outcomes. So you can imagine that each one of those steps could take a year or two or more uh, to do. Clinical trials sometimes take several years. So it may be three, four, five, six years before you really see this thing put to, to um, standard clinical use. I, I just don't know yet. We hope not, but it could be. Okay, thanks. Um, another question says, uh, first, thanks, fascinating. The question, as you noted, AI ultimately depends on the volume of the database. 
What are the implications then for Mayfield and regional medical centers like Cincinnati and all this? Is the key ultimately the ability to network with the national centers? Also, where are the computers housed? Thank you. Ah, uh, here. So the last question, um, they, they're, they're, they're company-owned cloud-based servers, um, at basically where the, the, the um, the computers are, I, I don't really know that question, or know the answer to that one, uh, but I was suspected somewhere in the, in the um, company's well, warehouses, uh, it, somewhere in the States, it's an American company. Um, the, but the, the answer to your first question is absolutely yes. Our ability to coordinate with other centers and share data is, it is absolutely critical to moving the needle on uh, issues like this because uh, it's, we get so much better data, so much more data when we collaborate like this. Uh, Maple's been doing this for uh, neuroscience, uh, stroke, aneurysm, and vascular care for many, many years through a, a research group that we call the Endovascular Neurosurgery Research Group. It's a group that I helped start back in 2004 uh, uh, and now has grown to uh, about 43 different uh, specialists in 37 different centers around the country. Uh, and interestingly, we uh, we are uh, just recently had collaborated on the effects of COVID uh, and, and coronavirus with stroke, how it affected patients, how it uh, um, affected healthcare workers. And we have a few different publications coming out. One that just came out that was very interesting that showed that uh, uh, during the, the lockdown phase of COVID, that many people who were having stroke symptoms were actually not coming into the hospital, and those who were were coming in about two hours later. And as you can see from the graphs I showed you earlier, that's a bad problem. That is a very significant issue, and, then, and we want to get that word out. Working by ourselves, I mean, Mayfield recognized this trend, but we don't have, an, uh, you know, don't treat enough patients to come up with the statistics that would show it and prove it. But when we collaborated with 12 other stroke centers around the country and shared all the same data together, it, the, the findings were obvious. Um, and we're hopeful that that'll turn out into an important public service message to tell people that if you're having chest pain and heart attack symptoms, if you're having weakness, uh, speech troubles, loss of vision and stroke symptoms, do not wait. Don't worry about COVID. Come to the hospital. They will keep you safe. They will take care of you. Um, but collaboration like that is the key to getting those messages out. Thank you. Um, another question is, do you have any outcome data that shows the Viz AI, Viz AI has improved outcomes? So we're actually working on that. That's a very interesting question. I mean, it seems kind of intuitive that it, that it has because there's no question in my mind that I get to patients faster when we're using this kind of workflow than, than when we're not. Um, but com but that, that requires the very same kind of comparison that we just talked about. So again, we'll be, that's one of the things that the Viz AI uh, um, uh, scientists want to do with us, uh, uh, with Mayfield and with some of the other stroke centers around the country that are using this service, is can we look at uh, historical controls, time to treatment uh, before versus after using Viz AI, and what did that mean as far as the outcome for the patient? Um, we, so again, we think we know the answer to that, but uh, again, we, we have to kind of prove it. Um, kind of related is how does the community know which hospitals have this technology to know where they might receive the best care? Thank you so much for this presentation. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, some of the some of the centers that are using it, I think, are publicizing its use uh, on their um, patient education and public education pages. Uh, we are currently using it, as I mentioned, with TriHealth. That's where we started first. Uh, then it was at Mercy, and most recently we helped St. Elizabeth um, launch their their use of it. So those three health systems all all all, all have it, and use it on a regular basis. Um, uh, and I think there 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 may be others uh, who use it to a lesser degree. Um, thanks. So here's another one. In 2018, our support group went to Good Sam for a presentation on the construction of a new neuro ICU. Can you update us on where that stands and also on the TriHealth Neuroscience Institute? I saw that several new neurologists have been hired. That is correct, correct and good memory and good observation. Uh, we are proud to say that the neuroscience ICU is, uh, is up, up and um, active. 
uh, it took an interesting turn. Um, we had planned to uh, physically remodel the same floor, the 12th floor of Good Samaritan Hospital, where the old ICU was into a bigger ICU, and thought that that would take a couple of years worth of construction to, to, to do. Uh, but then uh, the TriHealth as a system decided to uh, move all of their cardiothoracic surgery to Bethesda North and kind of concentrate the heart center up there. They still, of course, treat heart attacks and things everywhere that it could examine as well. But, but the more complicated uh, surgery they were going to do uh, and focus up at Bethesda North, which suddenly opened up the, their old uh, cardiothoracic ICU unit. So we simply moved the neuroscience unit into the old cardiothoracic ICU, kind of remodeled it and, and reconfigured it a bit. And we have, uh, as a result, we've gone from six up to 18 beds for the neuroscience ICU. And I can tell you they're almost always full. It is a busy, busy unit. More importantly than that, though, is the people who have come around to help build and run that program. We have uh, hired some very, very talented neurocritical care people who are, uh, you know, they live in that unit. They're there taking care of every bit, uh, uh, every piece of, uh, of that, every patient. Um, you know, very, very carefully monitoring everything that happens there, as well as participating in the Viz AI uh, uh, coordination, as I mentioned earlier, so that they know when, uh, you know, critically ill stroke patients are coming, even before they get them. <clears throat> uh, and, and yes, we've also hired neurologists, uh, looking at, at neurologists with multiple different specialty areas. Uh, TriHealth has the um, uh, as a, uh, some epileptologists, they have a general neurologist, a couple of very good headache specialists. Uh, the only uh, fellowship trained neuro-oncologist in the region is a tri-health neurologist. I mean, so they've really put together a great team and are still working on building it even more. Very nice. Thanks for that update. Um, here's, I think, our last question, and it says, our brain aneurysm support group can provide support, education, Etc. to aneurysm survivors and caregivers once they have been discharged from the hospital and are able to attend meetings. From your perspective, can a survivor be of support to inpatients as well? For example, if a patient or loved one is scared and could benefit from talking to a survivor while in the hospital, is there a way for us to get our contact info to the nurse manager or CMP in the NSICU? I think that's a fantastic idea, and that's what I love about this group. You guys, you you guys are awesome. <laughs> we get so much out of you um, that, uh, that 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 you, the members of this support group, are really what makes it all tick. I think it's a fantastic idea, um, and I would be happy to forward that suggestion on to our nurse managers in the neurocritical care unit. Again, we uh, I think uh, the Good Sam Neuro ICU has become probably the busiest neurovascular center in the region. <laughs> so you could have the potential to, to impact a lot of lives that way. And you're right, loved ones are scared. Um, many times the patients don't even know to be scared. There, there's so much going on with them, but the loved ones are often very, very nervous, very, very worried. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what, when their loved one's going to come home. They're not you know, sure how they're going to act when they come home. They're not sure how long it's going to take for things to get better. Uh, hearing from somebody who's been that, down that road and, and knows it personally uh, could be really, really outstanding. So I, I'm going to take that suggestion and, and forward it on to our nurse managers here in the, in the uh, neuro ICU. That's great. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, it's clear to me there are some more comments here that are very um Thank, they're very appreciative of you taking the time to do this uh, this great presentation. So I think this will wrap up the Q&A time. And I just want to add um, that I think uh, your, your feedback is important to us. So take a moment to fill out the survey that will appear when you exit the webinar tonight. If you don't have time right now, that is OK. We'll be sending follow up emails that will include confirmation of the recording availability. So you can listen to this again or share it with anyone who missed it as well as another link to the survey. So you can uh, always fill it out on a different day. But I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and have a great rest of the week.